patients stand out and get in. I'm Judy Rabinovitz, Certified Educational Planner, and I'd like to just remind everyone that we are broadcasting this on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live simultaneously, and we are also recording it. So it will be posted on our website probably within 24 hours of this evening's presentation. There's a number of, um, I would say, handouts if we were in person. I'm so used to saying that. But there are um, a number of downloads that you'll find very useful that will remain on our website. But things that would supplement this evening's presentation, some statistical information. And um, anyway, just lots of good background information that you can get um, if you just go to the web, the, our website where the webinar is posted at scorewebinars.com, you'll see um, four links for these different um, files that you can download to your computer. And let's start with the premise that colleges are the kind of student that a college is looking for is someone who is really actively engaged in his or her um, learning um, community. Um, basically is a fully involved student and has been even during COVID-19. And colleges are definitely looking, you know, beyond the academics and, and test scores for students who exhibit, you know, resilience and, and grit. And, you know, they're just very, very determined, goal-oriented. And yes, looking for more and more of that at the more, most competitive schools and a little bit less at the less competitive schools, think of it as being, you know, on a sliding scale. So with that in mind, these are the 10 most important factors that colleges use to evaluate students. And as long as you know, you know, the importance of these particular factors um, and how you can sort of highlight them and enrich or enhance them, will make all the difference in college admission. So I'm actually going to go over them, you know, one at a time, tell you what they are looking for and um, give you tips as we go into the things that you can do to enrich, you know, your life and um, improve your chances for admission to your top choice colleges. So one thing to also keep in mind is that colleges do, especially now with so much test optional, more of a holistic application review, which basically means that they consider the whole applicant um, more than just your numbers. It's really like, who are you as a person? And keep in mind that when your application, you know, if it were printed out, um, which is for most colleges, they are reading online, but if it were printed out, it would be 12 to 15 pages. And um, an admissions officer, typical, you know, day or couple of days might be um, a stack as high as a 20 story building of all of the applications. And so what happens is that uh, on average, it might take about 10 minutes for your application to be reviewed. And yes, you've agonized over it for, for hours, weeks, months. Um, you've rewritten your personal statement and each essay a half a dozen times. Um, and all you get is, is 10 minutes. So in those 10 minutes, you have to be able to create in, in the reader's eyes something incredibly memorable, um, a story, a picture of, of who you are so that your admission counselor will advocate for you. Because typically what may happen in many admission offices is that there will be some students who at an initial review um, will be just so incredibly strong that they will be passed up to the dean or the director for approval and admission. Others who are at the other end of the spectrum um, for whom there doesn't seem to be a great you know, academic match um, or other qualities that might make that student a great fit. And so those students may be immediately put in a pile not to be reviewed further. Um, and the vast majority of students will, will go on to additional reviews, will be reviewed in committee. And typically when a student is reviewed in an admissions committee with you know, 8, 10, 12, whatever number of admission um, counselors there are, the rep who is responsible for you, typically the person um, who represents your state or your county, um, is going to present you and hopefully advocate for you. And especially if you've, you know, created a memorable, you know, persona. 
So let's start with, with the academic record because truly that does set the stage for everything else. While it is true that if someone is applying for a BFA in, you know, say, you know, perform in, in visual arts um, or, perform, or performing arts, um, or maybe a um, heavily recruited athlete, that academic record may not carry quite as much weight, but for virtually everyone else, your academic record is the most important factor because colleges need to determine if you can do the work. So they're not just looking at GPA. So in other words, um, if I have a 4.0 GPA, that's not going to get me into, let's say, University of Florida or Harvard. Yes, A students go to those schools, but the colleges are looking for far more than just your GPA. Colleges do what I'll call a granular review of your um, your transcript, looking at it, you know, course by course. And what they're really looking for is rigor. How much have you challenged yourself? And the more selective the university is, the more they are looking for challenge. So for instance, to give you one idea, Florida State University, which is one of our flagship state universities, um, not necessarily the hardest one to get into, but certainly pretty difficult to get into. This past year, or for the current freshman class, the average number of AP or equivalent, like IB, ACE, um, dual enrollment, um, core dual enrollment, courses for an admitted student was nine. And I mean nine full years of something you know like AP. So uh, rigor of, of curriculum is incredibly important. And if you do go to a school that does not give, say, AP courses, you can only be evaluated against what is available in your school. In fact, on Common App's school recommendation form, your counselor actually has to rate or evaluate the rigor of your curriculum on a five-point scale. And so if you're applying to an extremely selective school, with, let's say single-digit admission rates, then they are looking for students who are rated at the very highest level, you know, at a, let's say a five is the highest, um, which says that this is the student who takes the most rigorous curriculum that we offer. Now, in addition to challenging yourself with the, let's say, I don't want you to challenge yourself to the point of like, oh my God, I'm going to kill myself. You know, I'm so stressed out. That's not what we want. It, that's And if that's, you know, <sighs> That's not what you should be looking for. You should be looking to take the most challenging courses that you can comfortably handle. Because after all, um, you know, our, our college applicants are, are teenagers. Um, they should have full rich lives, you know, full of time with family and friends, not just school and, you know, extracurriculars that they enjoy. So they need to have time to really balance their lives. However, they do need to be taking five core courses every single semester. And by core, I mean English, math, science, social science, foreign language, and I'll throw computer science into that as well. So there's really sort of six core subjects, um, but you do need to have five of them, you know, every year. And what that typically means is that by the time a student gets to be a senior, I just say that student says, well, you know, I've already met my requirement for graduation for math or for science, and therefore I don't need to take it wrong. So even if you plan never to take another math or science course again, although you probably will have to in college for a graduation requirement, seniors do need to have a math course and they do need to have a science course. And depending upon how selective of a university you're trying to get into, the science courses that weigh the most in the eyes of college admission are biology, chemistry, and physics. Environmental, um, like AP environmental, is not nearly as important to them unless you're planning to major in something related to environmental science. So the colleges are also looking for the students who are you know, taking, as I said, the AP, ACE, dual enrollment, IB, honors, basically just challenging themselves to get ready for college admission. But don't misinterpret. If I'm looking at a school that is not, you know, highly selective, perhaps a school that admits, you know, 50 or 60 percent of its students, I might not need to take any AP courses. And maybe I've taken my first one or two honors courses, um, you know, as a senior, because I'm trying to get ready for the rigors 
of college and it's best to take some of the more challenging courses now while I'm still, you know, in high school at home and have my whole support system around me. And while two years of um, foreign language, two years of the same foreign language is usually the minimum, many colleges are looking for three or four. Many of them don't make it a requirement, but they but recognize that having three or four years of the same foreign language um, can en enhance your curriculum and improve your chances for admission. Now, if you decide that you absolutely abhor, let's say Spanish, and you decide that after Spanish two, you're done, as long as you replace it with a challenging academic, you know, core course, you'll, you should be just fine unless you're applying to some of the most selective universities in this country. And then I'd say you definitely want to have at least three years of that same foreign language. And they're also looking for, for you to sort of sustain an interest. Um, for instance, if, if I'm going to be, let's say, applying as an engineering major, they're going to want to see courses that sort of sustain that interest in, in engineering, which basically means having at least a year, maybe two years of physics. Or similarly, if I'm going to be majoring in business, that I've, I've you know, taken bare minimum of pre-calculus, but preferably also taken calculus. So the, the more rigorous the curriculum that you can comfortably handle, the better off you are. And if you feel that your curriculum may not be that strong, you might be looking at, at something like, say, FLVS to take an extra course and pick that up right now, or perhaps over the summer, find a way to, you know, enrich your curriculum. So many colleges do recalculate your GPA rather than use the GPA that's actually on your transcript. And for the, uh, I'm going to start with the, what I'll call the core unweighted GPA, where only those really important academic subjects that are listed here count, as well as, let me say, the majority of AP, IB, ACE, and approved dual enrollment courses. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about that in, in a few screens. But basically, you're going to throw away your art courses unless they were AP. Same thing with music, um, driver's ed, PE, health, anything that doesn't fall in one of these areas. And even an introductory computer course, if it did not have programming in it, would not be considered core. So you're going to throw away everything other than the core. And if you've taken any high school courses in middle school, like many students have had, say, Algebra 1, Geometry, even Spanish 1 in middle school, most universities will count those. So I'd say for now, include them. And then you're going to convert your letter grades to numbers, you know, A is 4, B is 3 you know, etc. And sometimes students say, well, what if I failed a course and then I retook it and I got an A? Depends on the university. Some will count both the A and the F and others may count only the A. And so I would urge you to calculate it both ways so that you can see what the difference it would be. <clears throat> but essentially, um, oh, and let, let me also, as an aside, some of your courses are EOCs so that you get, like, for instance, in Algebra 1, you have a year-end grade. But if I take pre-calculus, I have a first semester and a second semester grade. So the only way you can actually calculate a GPA is if you're doing either all year-end grades or all semester grades. Or if you go to a school that is on a trimester, it's all trimester grades. They all have to be the same. So for those of you who are in a public high school, since the majority of your grades are semester grades, like when you took, say, um, English 10, you got a first semester grade and a second semester grade. What I would do is take any EOC that you have only a year end grade and double it so that you're always using semester grades. And you're going to take that for as many years of, of you know, of classes as grades as you have. You're going to add up all of those points and then divide that number of points by the number of core courses that you use. So for example, let's just say that you're currently a junior. So that means that chances are you had five core courses each semester, your freshman year and your sophomore year, but you don't have junior year grades yet. So chances are you're going to be adding up 20 grades. And then of course, if you had a few in middle school, you'll be adding them to it as well.
So I'm adding up all the fours and threes and hopefully not too many of those smaller numbers, dividing by the total number of core courses. That gives me my core unweighted GPA. And honestly, for the colleges that use a GPA, and not all colleges do use a GPA, that's the GPA they're using. Um, if a college tells you that their average GPA is, you know, like a 4.2, well, then you know it's an, not an unweighted, but a weighted GPA. And if you're not sure if a college said, well, our average is a 3.9, you can always ask if it's a weighted or unweighted GPA, if it comes from the transcript or if it's been recalculated. But just know the majority of schools do use this core unweighted GPA, which, by the way, is not the same as the unweighted GPA that's on your transcript, because the unweighted GPA on your transcript would also include things like art and PE. So chances are this unweighted GPA might be a bit lower than the GPA on your transcript. Okay, but now we're, let's talk about the weighted because you might say, but wait, 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 what about all the AP and honors courses I took? Don't I get credit for that? And the answer is yes, because that would be in a core weighted GPA. So we have that sum that we already got before by adding up all the fours and threes, et cetera. And what we're now going to do is for every semester course that was honors, I'll add a half a point and it could be honors or pre-AP or pre-IB or whatever your school may call something that is considered honors. It's a half a point. And then an AP, IB, ACE and what I'll call approved dual enrollment would be one point. Now, this is very different from what a public high school does here in Florida. Many of you know that you get six points for like your AP, you know, you get an A, an A push, an AP U.S. history. It's four points for the A and two points for the AP, but that's not how colleges do it. Colleges will do one point for those that do a weighted GPA, one point for the AP, IB, ACE, and for now, let's just say almost all dual enrollment. And they'll only do this if you got a C minus or better. So in other words, if you took AP Chem and you got a D, you're going to get a one for the D, but you're not going to get any extra weight because it was AP. So after you add all the halves and holes to the, the total you had before, <laughs> you would just be dividing by the number of core courses as you had done before. And what that gives you is the core weighted GPA, and that is the GPA that every one of our 12 state universities in Florida will use. And many other state universities also do a core weighted GPA and use a calculation like this. <clears throat> Let me go a little bit further now about which particular AP or dual enrollment courses might be used. And within our state university system of Florida, um, you can see that there's a difference. And I only looked at three of them were challenging state universities to get into. But for UF and FSU, you can see that they will count every single AP, IB, and ACE course that you've taken, whereas UCF actually has an approved list. And I've got links on the bottom um, that show you where these approved lists are. And then for dual enrollment, it's, it's really not all dual enrollment courses that give you the extra weight. It's only those that are approved. And again, it's a matter of going to that approved list. Um, I will say that colleges know when kids are playing the rank game. And by that, I mean our public universities use a weighted GPA to calculate a rank. So it's a weighted rank. And so students know that if they take dual enrollment courses, in terms of the way their high school calculates a GPA, they'll get four points for the A and another two points, remember the high school calculation, and that six points is going to do a lot to raise a student's rank. So sometimes students will take courses that are relatively easy, like, you know, um, a dual enrollment health course. Colleges know when you're sort of playing that game and that you're not doing this for the sheer love of learning. And it could actually hurt you more than help you if you take um, dual enrollment courses that are not, let's say, rigorous. Um, my advice to students always is for dual enrollment course, take a dual enrollment course if you have a conflict in your schedule. So, for example, let's say that AP Physics 1 and um, AP um, English Lit are offered at exactly the same time. And I can only take one of them. 
I would pick one of them in my high school and then I could take the other one dual enrollment. But the student who doesn't have a course conflict and decides, well, listen, AP English is really too hard. I'm going to take ENC 1101, which is the dual enrollment equivalent um, in English of one year of, of high school English. Um, if your guidance counselor in the letter of recommendation indicates that the reason that you took, you know, ENC 1101 and 1102 was because they conflicted with the time that, you know, AP Physics or AP Latin or some other course was offered, then you are be absolutely fine taking that ENC 1101, 1102. But by the same token, if there was no conflict and you just took it because it was easier than AP, that might not, that would not be looked upon as favorable at a school that was super rigorous um, in terms of, or super competitive in terms of admission, um, it would be fine if the school perhaps was admitting, you know, let's say 35 or 40 or more percent of, of, of students. But they really do want to see kids challenge themselves. So what I could do is, for example, if I've been advanced in math, as many kids are, and have gotten through a number of years of math in middle school, it may be that I've had both years of AP calculus before I become a senior. In that case, taking a higher level math course dual enrollment would be ideal. So taking something like dual enrollment linear algebra or dual enrollment DiffEq, differential equations, would really be ideal. Or if I've taken AP Psych and I loved it, I'm even thinking about majoring in Psych, and I take a dual enrollment course, let's say, in a higher level Psych, say abnormal Psych, that would be fine as well, because what I'm doing is I'm taking um, a higher level core course that's not available in my high school. So there are certain dual enrollment courses that I think can really, you know, enrich your life, enhance your chances for college admission, and others where colleges may recognize that all you're trying to do is, you know, raise your, your GPA and rank and that it's, you're not motivated by the love of learning. And there's a huge difference there. If you wanted to easily recalculate your GPA um, and see what it would come out to in terms of like a state university in Florida, um, if you go on my website, recalculatemygpa.com, you'll actually be able to put in um, all the, the numbers that you need and we'll calculate that GPA for you. And I did mention before that not all colleges actually calculate a GPA. You may say, well, how do they then evaluate me? Um, some colleges will just look at your transcript granularly um, at the number of A's, at the where you've challenged yourself, um, what percentage of your courses were really, you know, highly challenging, whether you had, um, you know, math and science as, as, as a senior, um, and they will come up with an index and they will rate you on their index system in terms of how well they feel that you match their academics um, how likely you are to be successful on their campus. So it might be a nine point scale where kids who get a nine, eight or seven are you know, really in good shape, anything lower, not so good. It could be a five point scale and maybe a one is the highest, but there definitely are colleges out there that just don't do a GPA and will just as I said, give you some type of an index or a rating instead. Um, in, in a couple minutes, I will break for some questions. And by the way, if you do have questions, please feel free to just type them in, in the chat box. And um, when um, Kathy, who's um, running the show um, in the background, um, sees that there is a question, a mysterious voice will come on and she'll interrupt me and, and let me know that there is a question. Anyway, after your academic you know, record, the, the next thing that really matters are solid SAT and a ACT scores. And I know you're all saying, well, wait, 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 all these colleges right now are test optional. So I don't have to take the SAT or the ACT. So let me explain what test optional, first of all, really does mean. And actually, we've done a few webinars on it um, in much greater depth than this. So I'm just going to gloss over it so that you get the basics of it and what's really important. But basically, colleges that are test optional basically are saying, um, we're not, we're going to de-emphasize the role of SAT or ACT, that we're going to look at everything else in your file and perhaps, you know, give it all more weight. And the SAT or ACT for the kids who don't submit it just won't, 
you know, influence a decision. We'll ba base our decision on, on everything else. And it's important to know, though, that test optional doesn't mean test blind. In other words, if I submit an SAT or ACT score, they're absolutely going to use that score in evaluating me. So understand that your scores will still play a major role in admission. And in fact, a very recent research study that was conducted by Common App um, I sort of broke down like who was more likely to apply to college test optional, in other words, without scores, and who was more likely to submit. And, and I want to say, as I tell you what these categories are, that I think if you fall into the category of these are the kinds of kids who tended to submit, chances are that means you should be taking the test and submitting as well if you fall into one of these categories. So the kids who were submitting tend to come from um, wealthier families and very, very well-resourced schools and also live in an area that had widely available testing. And the students who are more likely to not submit scores came from completely the opposite. They came from, um, I believe it was like the lowest quintile of, of income in terms of family income. They came from underrepresented minority families, first generation families, and much less resourced schools. And in areas where testing was largely canceled throughout the almost all of you know um, the pandemic so far. I'm gonna also go so far as to tell you that some colleges on their applications um, besides asking you whether you want your scores to be considered or not, will tell you that once you make that decision, you can't change your mind. So if I say, don't consider my scores, and then I later get a great score, they say that some of the schools will say that they don't want it. Um, other schools will have on their application that if you have chosen to apply test optional, please explain why. So I can tell you, I was on the phone the other night with a student who um, decided not to take the SAT because, or the ACT, because the counselors at her school told them test optional really does mean test optional. And if you don't feel that a score would be really reflective of who you are as a student, don't bother to take it. So um, I have to say that I don't agree with it, but I will, will add that if you feel unsafe taking the SAT or ACT because you feel there will be too many kids in that same room, then by all means, I would say, you know, don't take it because it's not worth risking your health. So just understand that, you know, test optional means um, it, it's truly like your decision whether or not to submit your scores. Um, it is much more competitive. It has become much more competitive um, last year, and we expect it to remain the same this year. More than half of all the colleges in this country are now test optional. Not true for the state universities here in Florida or Georgia or for Bright Futures, um, for that matter. But do understand that you'll be competing against a much larger pool of kids it, at pretty much any selective, and I don't mean just highly selective, at any very at, at any large college, any prestigious college, any relatively selective college, has gotten far more applications last year, and we fully anticipate that it will continue this year. And um, because, basically, because almost all the colleges from last year that were test optional because of COVID maintained that stance um, for this year. And just something else that you need to know. Um, I think it's about roughly 1,600 colleges that are test optional. And NACAC, which is the National Association for College Admission Counseling, um, had a pledge that they put into effect last year that basically says test optional means test optional. In other words, we're not going to penalize you in any way for admission, for scholarships, for financial aid, if you submit without a score. So if 1,600 colleges are test optional, you would have expected close to 1,600 colleges to sign um, the NACAC pledge. I believe it was under 600 colleges that actually signed the pledge. Anyway, I'll let you draw your own conclusions about test optional. But I truly believe that if you have competitive scores, um, you should submit them. And history has shown from before COVID-19 for colleges that were test optional, like for instance, University of Chicago was the most competitive college ever to have gone test optional 
years before COVID-19. However, um, their statistics showed, first of all, that the overwhelming majority of kids um, did submit scores. And also history has shown that for many, many colleges, the sub kids who submitted were accepted at a higher rate than the kids who didn't submit. Anyway, if you'd like to see what colleges are um, test optional, test blind, test free, test flexible, there's lots of terminology out there. There's a wonderful website that is completely up to date, fairtest.org, that you can look up any college. Um, in fact, you can see the entire list of colleges with their um, optional or, or free or flexible policies. And just as we close down on you know talking about um, test optional. I do want to talk about a, a pretty famous, you know, well-read, well-respected college admissions or education um, journalist, Jeff Salingo, who's um, very widely read, very widely quoted. And he specifically said last year that students who had test scores get accepted more often. And in fact, sometimes the admit rate was twice as high for students with scores than those without. And he cited the example of these four schools. We've actually done our research and, and found quite a few more. And in fact, in one of my other webinars, and I think I'll mention it at the very end, um, I actually showed the data from a number of other schools. But you can see that, you know, the admit rate in some cases was twice as much for the kids who submitted scores. And, and you might say, by the way, that the kids who submitted scores probably had much stronger grades because they had strong scores. And yes, that is probably very true. But still, there's something to be said about, you know, stark contrasts like this. So my advice to you is if you have competitive scores that are at or above a college's median for their most recently accepted class, um, you should submit. If you're applying to a very, very hard to get into major, um, computer science is one of the hardest majors to get into now. But then again, anything in engineering, um, nursing, even business, physician assistant, um, submit your scores if you're applying to, to those kinds of majors or also the more competitive dual degree programs. And by the way, some of the dual degree programs do require scores, even if the rest of the university does not. Um, if you're really trying hard to get into an honors program or looking for a particular scholarship, you may want to seriously consider submitting scores. But again, if they are good, many colleges are still requiring scores from homeschooled students. And in the past, I would have told you you should submit your scores if you're planning to um, you know, play NCAA sports, but they've taken away that requirement um, you know, for next year. So if you're going to be a recruited athlete, you still need to sub um, don't need to submit scores. But I will tell you, I'm working with um, some recruited athletes who are um, heavily recruited by Stanford and Stanford is still insisting upon scores for those students. Anyway, strong scores are definitely a plus factor in, you know, in the face of, of um, test optional. And I wanted to share with you some data that just came out. U.S. News and World Report comes out, you know, every year with data about its, quote, best colleges. Um, I didn't put the rankings here because I don't personally think it's important if a college is number one versus number 12. Um, I do like the fact that I can look at the data for um, hundreds of colleges in just one place. Um, this does not reflect this year's freshman class. It reflects last year's freshman class. It's not the admitted students. It is the enrolled students. But you also get the percentage accepted. And what I tried to do here was to pick some of the more popular schools that I have seen um, the students at, at our schools at SCORE Academy get into, as well as the students in my private practice. These seem to be very, very popular schools for Florida kids. And I just thought it was very important for you to have you know, some idea of what these numbers may look like in terms of, of test scores. And also know that when you're looking at a state university, let's say University of Georgia, where it says the admit rate is 48%, that's an overall admit rate. Some colleges do divulge the admin rate for in-state versus out-of-state. And for many, many state universities, the admit rate for the out-of-state student is lower than the admit rate for the in-state students. So for example, University of Virginia is one that shares that information. So does the entire University of California system. So some of that information is, you know, is available. And then 
because I think it's so important, since we're here in Florida, I wanted to share with you the, the latest statistics from all 12 of our state universities. The, these numbers do reflect the admitted students for this year. So you can see specifically, and this is for fall admission, the, the mid 50% range. So for example, if I look at FSU and see the range is 4.2 to 4.6, we're not saying this is a cutoff. That doesn't by any means say that you have to have a 4.2. And remember, it's a core weighted GPA. It's telling you 25% of the kids who are getting in have less than a 4.2. And the question of course is how much less? And of course, 25% have more than a 4.6, but we don't necessarily care about those kids. What we're trying to figure out is, you know, do I fit? Am I somewhere in there? And similarly for SAT, ACT, and percent accepted, um, the ones that are starred did not yet have data available for the current freshman class. So this is the data from last year's freshman class. Um, it doesn't change terribly much from year to year for our state universities. So this is all completely current. And this is one of the downloadable um, documents. I think it's the first one listed for our state university system of what it took to get in. So while we're talking about testing, I think it's very important um, to understand what would be an effective testing calendar. But let me pause for a moment and see if there have been any changes, any questions coming in. Kathy, anything? No, nope, no questions yet. Okay, then I will keep going. So let's first look at sophomores. And you're going to notice that um, I've sort of used a turquoise color for anything related to the SAT because that is College Board's trademark color. And when it comes to the ACT, um, they are bright red and I am using their color for anything related to um, the ACT. So if you're currently a sophomore, chances are you'll be taking that PSAT on October the 13th. There are a few other dates it's given, but this is the most common date. Um, sometimes kids don't take it seriously because they know this is not a score that determines college admission. It's not a score that goes to colleges, but I can tell you that this is a baseline. This is a way to start beginning your college planning because you can see where your PSAT is, which is just a shorter, easier version of the SAT and determine like, God, how much more work do I need to do to get up to the score I need? Or maybe, you know, I'm already there. It's a very good idea to check with your counselor in school tomorrow to make sure this is when your school is giving it and that you are registered for it. And by the way, do not take the SAT yet as a sophomore. Um, you might be very tempted um, to take it, but I would strongly advise against it because many colleges are looking for all of your scores when you're submitting them. And you still have plenty of time to take it. I'm not a procrastinator at all, but there's no rush to take an SAT yet. And um, I do believe, though, that sophomores should consider taking the ACT at the very end of the year. Um, June 11th is after at least most of our kids here in Florida are done with school. My northern kids are still probably in school for another week or two. But it is the last ACT of the year. You've had the benefit of a full year of learning. And you may say, well, why take the ACT? You know, I, I might like the SAT. Um, but here's the really interesting thing that I think is, is not a widely known fact. ACT allows you to cancel scores from your permanent record. And you can cancel it at any time you want, you know, up until the time you're applying to college. They have a whole pr procedure for you to do it. It's documented on their website. You have to do it in writing, but you can remove a, a score from your ACT record so that if you have to report all of your ACT scores to a particular college because you're taking ACT instead of SAT, um, you can legitimately remove a score. You cannot do that with SAT. What you can do with SAT is if you walk out of a test and if you feel that I really didn't do my best, you know, the girl in front of me was sneezing all the time, or there was one reading passage that drove me crazy that I know I couldn't do, or I ran out of time on math, whatever it is. You have until the Thursday following that test to get in touch with College Board. And you have to do it in writing, and there's a procedure on their website, and you can cancel your test. Great. But you never find out your scores. So ACT is really a risk-free test. I don't like my score. I can actually toss it. If you go to a high school, a public high school in Palm Beach County, you'll have to talk to your guidance counselor about removing the score from your transcript. 
Broward County public schools don't put scores on their transcript and private schools also, most private schools don't put scores on their transcript either. And you'll see down in the bottom right, I've got something called test information release where you can pay to get a copy of your test, your answers and the correct answers. Um, there are three times during the school year when you can pay to get back a copy of either an SAT or an ACT and learn from your mistakes. Because after all, if I have the questions, my answers and the correct answers, I can try to reconstruct my thinking and figure out like where are my weaknesses? How do I avoid making these mistakes in the future? So I am very prone to making recommendations for taking the tests primarily during times when you can get them back. So the June ACT is definitely one that you can get back. And by the way, I can compare my experience with the June ACT with my October PSAT. And even though ACT is a harder test than PSAT, I can come out of this at the end of sophomore year and say, I know which is my better test, SAT or ACT. And that's what I'm gonna focus on from here on in. So I don't necessarily have to prep for both of them in the future. Okay, let's assume that you're a junior. And by the way, the dates that I'm giving you, even though um, one of them has already passed, these are the dates that the ACT was available um, this entire year. And, and these dates are pretty standard um, from year to year. Um, it, it's usually, you know, like say the second Saturday in, you know, December or the first Saturday, you know, in April. Um, again, you can see the dates when you can get back your ACT. But what I like very much is for juniors with the ACT to take the test in December. It will be a few months after you're going to take a PSAT, which I'll get to in a moment. But I can compare my performance on that PSAT to the um, ACT and determine then if I haven't already determined it, which is my better test, SAT or ACT. Remember, I can get this test back. I still have a couple months to prepare for it after a PSAT. And if I really like the ACT, I can continue taking that test. Again, I've given you all the dates, but I've highlighted the ones that I think are the better dates on which to take it. And you can absolutely test into, into your senior year um, for SAT or ACT. Typically, you can test all the way through first semester. I'll be a little bit more specific as, as I move forward with this. Um, looking at the SAT for juniors, please don't jump into taking the SAT, let's say, first semester. You really don't need to rush. Remember, it's not a risk-free test. If you wind up sending SAT scores to colleges, some of them may ask for all of your scores. And while they say they really only count your highest reading, writing, and your highest math, if they can see them all, they can use other scores however they like. I think that it is best to wait until you get back your PSAT results, which happens in December. And if you're basically you can learn from your mistakes. You can go online. You can get access to all the PSAT questions. Some schools will give back your physical test so that you'll see the writing that you did to arrive at your answers. And you can learn from your mistakes on that PSAT. Take it in October, analyze the results in December. And the next test that you can get after your PSAT results come back is a test in March. So personally, I think the March test is like the best one for juniors to take first if they're going to take an SAT. Um, the May test is also a good test. Both March and May are tests that you can get back by requesting um, the question and answer service. That's something you do, by the way, as, as part of the registration at the very end of the registration process. There's only one problem with the May date. Some of you may have figured that out already that the May date is when AP exams are given. Um, AP exams, IB exams, ACE exams. Um, my thoughts are though, however, if you know about these far enough in advance, which you do, you can space out your testing so that you can still test in May. But if you would rather not be overloaded all at the same time, then definitely aim for the March SAT. Assuming that you feel that SAT is, is really your better test, or if you're still not sure whether it's SAT or ACT, you know, my goal would be to have students figure out as early as possible, which is their better test so that they really only have to put in the maximum prep for one test. Um, 
I'd rather, if I'm going to spend, say, 30 hours prepping, I don't want to divide them 15 and 15. I'd rather have as many of those 30 hours as possible for an SAT or an ACT. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that's the number of hours you need to prep, but whatever you've set aside for prep, if you can make it for one test and figure out which is your better test. Um, anyway, one of the handouts that uh, downloads that you can get is my SAT versus ACT, explaining all the nuances of difference, how they are alike. Um, and there are lots of other ways for figuring out which is a better test for you, SAT or ACT. If you were to call us, um, we could get you set up to help figure out which is really your better test. Now, if you're currently a senior or when you will be a senior, um, first of all, there's still more tests that you can take this year currently, you know, as a senior. Not all those dates will make early decision deadlines, but all of them will make virtually every regular decision deadline that there is. And if you're applying to a school that has rolling admission, like let's say University of South Florida or University of Central Florida, um, you could even take a score, uh, a test and use a score from second semester. And for bright futures, you can test all the way until the end um, of the school year. And same thing with ACT. These are the dates for first semester of, of senior year. And again, every year the dates are very, very similar. So if you're currently a junior, just know that like all is not lost. If you don't get your dream score by the end of your junior year, you can test again you know, as a senior. And just sort of to summarize the last test dates that you could consider depending upon um, your college application deadlines, and also bright futures. And I will tell you if any of you um, parents have a student right now who's a, a freshman in college in a state university here in Florida or any university here in Florida, um, and that you're Florida residents, they can actually still test for bright futures all the way through December. Our board of governors extended it because of COVID so that kids still have an opportunity to get bright futures or the higher level of bright futures. We don't know whether for this year's seniors, it will again be extended to December, but for now I'm going to say that the June SAT and ACT would be the last test you could take for Florida's bright future scholarship. And just to make sure that everyone is aware of what it takes to get bright futures. Um, and the application actually opens up or creating your, your account opens up on October 1st. And you really don't do most of the work until much later when you have, you know, more grades and, and test scores. And the the exact like GPA and test score requirements don't apply for kids in IB or um, or ACE, depending upon whether you meet these requirements, then you may, um, your test scores won't matter. And let me just finish up the information about testing by saying that kids really do need to prep. Self prep may work in the beginning when you're first starting out, but I think professionally prepping using real tests um, and only real tests and taking simulated tests. For example, we give free simulations on Saturday mornings where you can sign up, you can take it virtually, um, a full length SAT, a full length ACT, it's timed, it's proctored. Um, on our website, we have a um, free simulation singular .com. You can sign up for any one of our free simulations. Um, you don't have to be a client, but I think it's very important for kids to take full and real tests um, as part of their preparation. But it's super important to find like a test prep instructor that, that your child can really bond with and not say, oh, do I really have to go again? Um, I know when I used to do test prep, I had to have fun with, with doing it. And I made sure that my students enjoyed my sessions and um, they should be sessions that are enjoyable and, and that really build confidence in a student. So, you know, we hope that perhaps for the future, you might think of us for um, your test prep needs, whether they're in person or, or virtual. So moving on now to the more personal factors. In other words, we've started out with the numbers, with the data, your, you know, your academic record and your test scores. Those are numbers. But now who are you really as a person? And your your extracurricular engagement, your commitment um, is what really matters next. And colleges want to see more like long-term commitment. 
um, leadership, anything special, anything that makes you stand out. They love to see kids, you know, who are, um, you know, really entrepreneurial and will start new things. And I firmly believe that students should create an activity resume and parents, you can help them get started even as early as, as ninth grade or even middle school and continuing to add to it. But think of it like almost not formatted the same way, but the same kind of detail that you would have on a work resume where there's bullet points to show like what you did, why you did it, how you did something differently um, than other people. What was the impact? Um, what leadership role did you have? There's certain things that you really want to highlight um, to show, you know, to let you stand out, um, to let you look a bit different than other people. And yes, honors and awards belong on here. They belong at the very end so that you look more humble. And I do not believe in putting on an activity resume things like um, where you go to school, what your GPA is, what your test scores are, what all of your AP courses are. Colleges have all that information on other parts of your application. This is strictly an activity resume um, that hopefully supports your choice of major as, as well as by the way that your academics would hopefully support your choice of major. So for example, um, if I apply to college as a potential engineering major, I really should have calculus and I really should have physics. Um, if I apply as a psych major, hopefully I had a year of psych, maybe a P psych, but I've, I've already studied that. And yeah, there'll be certain majors that you could not have studied for. In, but if I'm applying as a nursing major, I have a very strong, say, biology and chemistry background. Hopefully APs or IBs or ACEs, you know, in both of them. Anyway, you may ask, like, well, tell me more. Why is this resume so important? Um, that's the one thing that really lets you jump off the page, that when I go through someone's resume, I really understand what's important to them. How do they spend their time? And how are they going to be known when they get to my campus? Because remember what I told you in the beginning, colleges are looking for these vibrant kids who are going to be actively engaged. And um, there's one page on the common application, which is the most popular application since more than 900 of 900 well-known universities accept it. Um, there's a page called the activities page, which is probably the hardest page to complete on the common app, basically because they give you room to um, describe up to 10 activities. Although I like my kids to describe fewer because fewer activities with greater commitment is actually better than more activities. Basically a student who's angled, not well-rounded, you know, had just a few really solid interests. But the problem is they only give you 150 characters, including punctuation and spaces, to describe, it says to describe the activity. What it really means is describe your role in that activity. And you don't have a lot of room in 150 characters. And to say, you know, that I'm, I'm a four-year member of my high school's varsity swim team, when the lead in to that is the fact that you've been on varsity swim in grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. So they already know that. It's like, okay, how did you distinguish yourself, you know, as a swimmer? If I have a resume, it makes it so much easier to create to create a very impressive um, activities page that will stand out and will show the impact, you know, of what I've done with like lots of action verbs and, and accomplishments. Also, when, when kids have their own resume, it teaches them to really market themselves. So when someone says, you know, someone says to me like, well, so Judy, tell me a little bit about yourself. I don't sit there and go, um, um, well, see, I'm 17 and, and, and I go to, you know, Spanish River. And, mm -mm, you can go right into, well, let me tell you about Judy the math nerd and Judy the cheerleader, because those are the two things, the math competitions and the cheerleading that might show up the most, you know, on my resume. And truly that was me in high school. Anyway, um, if you're going to go for any interview, um, once you hand your interview or your resume or email it to them or her in advance for a Zoom interview, um, it provides you know, great talking points. You'll talk about the things that are important to you where you can get really excited and shine. And it means I'm always ready. If I have a resume, I can apply for an honor society, a job, an internship. 
And in fact, most of my students tell me that the resume that they created in high school, they reformatted it a bit in college. And as they got involved in college activities, they then sort of dropped off some of the older ones and less important ones from high school. And again, they were always ready. They could apply for um, a research project under a professor, um, an internship, a co-op program. And um, they felt that they just always knew how to present themselves. So essentially, you know, your resume just tells your story. And I think is one of the best ways for a student, you know, to stand out. Also, lots and lots of colleges ask for a resume. So there's more than 300 colleges on Common App, and this is just a very small sampling of some highly selective and not so highly selective universities on Common App that give you the opportunity um, for a resume upload. Now, it's not a requirement. It's optional. But I have to tell you, with one or two exceptions, everything that's, on, that's related to college where they say optional, 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 in my opinion, almost everything is required. Um, I'll tell you, the one thing I think is truly optional is the new COVID-19 essay question that was added to Common App last year, which is still there, um, is also on other applications. That one truly is optional, that if you feel that you were affected either in a very positive way because of, say, the community service that you did, or a very negative way um, by COVID-19, definitely write about it. But if you feel that your experience wasn't too dissimilar from many of your peers, it is really, really optional. Anyway, resume upload, in my opinion, is number one, doing activities is, to me is not optional. And uploading a resume um, can only improve my chances for admission. There are a couple of, of other colleges, about a dozen or so that we've counted so far, that um, don't ask for the resume on the Common App, but they do on their website or on their portal. Basically, after you submit an application, within a week or two weeks, you should check either on their website, they may have a special place or something they call their portal or their status check page, um, basically to make sure that they have everything that they need. But that's where you may get a request for a resume upload. So for example, that's something that Emory University does. Even Florida State University says, this is the place to upload your resume. It's also the place they want you to upload your personal statement and your test scores. It's a little bit unusual, but that's how FSU does work. And then both Georgetown and MIT, which have their own applications, they are two of the only, in my opinion, very, very well-known colleges that are not on Common App. They do ask on their own application um, for a resume. And just to give you an idea about what a resume can look like, there is no standard format for you know, a student's activity resume. So I'm going to show you three different resumes. Um, they're all resumes I have permission to show from students from several years back. Um, but I have changed their names or um, we used to put social security number on it ages ago. We don't do it anymore. But anyway, um, I try to keep things organized categorically. So this was a student who was going pre-med. I can tell you that the student has since graduated from an Ivy League institution, as well as that same institution's med school, is now a practicing physician. But you can see that the amount of research that he did and then his, his volunteer work in a hospice, but there's some nitty gritty detail and almost every bullet either highlights a um, an award he won or begins with an action verb in the correct tense. So this was, um, a, and put the category together, science and outreach, because they both go really well if somebody is looking for pre-med. So this was one of my debaters who, again, went to a very highly selective university. What I'm showing you are the successful, you know, resumes of the students who did get into their top choice colleges. So colleges do love debaters. Um, debaters tend to be more worldly kids, more well-informed kids, um, kids who know how to how to speak publicly, have lots of self-confidence, um, know how to do research, and can understand different perspectives on um, the same issue. So here we highlighted um, his most important um, debate wins, recognitions, as well as the leadership that he had. And like that previous one, it also had graphics on it. And yes, these are teenagers. They can have graphics on the resumes. 
And then finally, um, a student who used a completely different format um, and highlighted some, you know, basically she had put everything into just one category called extracurriculars because she did have a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But I guess it was a lot of a little bit because she also did wind up um, at a very elite university. And by the way, the colors on here were the colors of the university to which she applied. So she changed the colors for every single university. Okay, next up in the personal side of who you are will be your essays. And I'm sure that those of you who have seniors have already seen your kids agonizing over, oh my God, it's the hardest thing I've ever had to write, even for the really gifted writer. Um, I don't think that there's anything harder than writing about yourself. Um, but, but your essay sort of gives another lens into something special about you, some personality trait, um, how you responded to some, you know, event. It doesn't have to be, you know, life-threatening or, or traumatic. It can be an essay that makes the reader laugh or, or cry. Um, it's just something incredibly, incredibly personal. And the best advice I can give you parents is that, yes, you should discuss possible topics with your kids because no one has known them longer or better. But please do not write or edit for them. Because the way someone, let's say, who's in his or her 50s writes is not the same as the way a teenager writes. And I know that when we work with, with, with students, we draw the line at certain places in terms of how far we will go in helping them improve um, and what we'll do in terms of, of recognizing where they need different wording or they haven't been insightful enough or haven't drawn the right conclusion. Um, but we've worked with teenagers long enough that we know how to talk to them in ways to make them improve their essays in their own voice. So yes, it's a good idea to read your child's essay if he or she wants to share it. Don't be surprised if they don't. Some are writing about um, pretty personal things and don't want to share with their parents. Um, but it, it's great if you can read it and figure out, like, what did you learn about your child from this? But don't take out that red pen recommendations definitely play a role, not nearly as important as the other things that we've mentioned. But by the way, without scores, the academics play a stronger role. The colleges are looking for stronger academics. They're looking for, you know, um, you know, a, a more dramatic um, extracurricular involvement, um, better essays. And we're looking for what I'm calling anecdotal recommendations. In other words, it's a recommendation that goes into detail about your child. So if my math teacher wrote on my recommendation that Judy is the math student I've been waiting 40 years to have in my class. She's a delight. She's always prepared. Um, I highly recommend her for your university. That's going to be thrown in the garbage. It may be really positive, but it says nothing about me personally. It needs to go into nitty gritty detail about something that I've done in my math class. And it might be how I led a particular study group um, trying to solve, you know, um, for Matt's last theorem. Or how I came up to the board in my um, calculus class to explain why one uses integration to find, I can't remember now, is it the volume under um, a curve or the area under a curve? Um, so it goes into detail, which also means that your kids can share information with their teachers um, in a nice way, not saying, hey, I really want you to write this about me, but by saying, if a teacher agrees to write a recommendation, to be able to say to the teacher, um, I'd like to share some information with you so that you understand, you know, how I was impacted by your class and um, why everything that, you know, your impact on me was so special. So first of all, that's great for a teacher to hear, and, and hopefully it's true. They're not just brown-nosing their teachers. Um, but that's where I can write something about the study group I led on for Matt's last theorem or, you know, the work I did on, in, you know, um, integration or differentiation or what, whatever it, it may be. And because counselors also need to write recommendations for most colleges for students, you as a parent 
can feel free to share personal information with the counselor, even if it's not asked for, and to say, hey, dear counselor, I recognize that you may have hundreds of kids for whom you're writing recommendations and, and haven't had the opportunity to get to know all of them as well as you might like. But there are a few things about Judy that I'd like to share with you um, that might help you in writing you know, your recommendation. And then my mom would go into some level of detail. I love to give my counselor my resume because then my counselor can also write about my extracurricular commitment, backing up what I've said in my application. And if I do share my re my resume with my teachers, um, which many of them will ask for, I need to be sure that my teachers are writing about me academically, not extracurricularly. I'm asking them because they were my physics teacher, my English teacher. I want them to write about what kind of a student I was and to perhaps pull something from my extracurriculars that would support that subject. And, you know, talk about, you know, you know, using my creative writing skills in terms of, you know, debate or, or, or something like that. Okay, and, and by the way, most of our state universities in Florida, not only don't require recommendations, but don't accept them. And again, in that first handout I have about our 12 state universities, I do list each um, state university's requirements or lack of requirements for recommendations. Okay. Demonstrated interest. Um, colleges don't always, are not always as forthcoming in terms of what role does it play. But colleges are very concerned with what's called yield. Um, yield is the percentage of students who say yes back to a college after they've been admitted. And they all strive to get incredibly high yield. Um, it, it's worth it for their, their, you know, their prestige, their, perhaps their rating in, in U.S. news or other rankings. Um, what all the, the research has shown is that students who visit colleges, and whether it's in person or virtual, and who demonstrate their interest are much more likely to say yes back to the college than the students who are ghosts. And, and, and a ghost is considered a student who fully applies, sends in everything, but is never once called, never once emailed, has made no contact whatsoever, has not interacted with a rep at a college fair or at, you know, when co colleges have come to visit or done virtual visits at their high schools. The kids who have shown their interest, especially at private universities and relatively selective, not the most selective, um, that's where demonstrated interest can make a difference. And of course, um, before COVID-19, and we are starting to see this come back, visiting a college in person um, for a campus tour is one of the best ways to demonstrate your interest because also you learn so much about that college that when you have to write an respond to an essay prompt, which is, why are you applying to our college, which is an incredibly common additional essay. Yes, there's much more than the personal statement. There's some colleges like Stanford might have as many as nine or 10 additional essays. Same thing with Wake Forest or Michigan has two extra ones. UCF has three extra ones. UF has one. So um, if I have visited that campus, I can get a lot of questions answered. I can pick up a lot of detail I didn't get, have elsewhere. And I can write a much more insightful and cogent, why do I want to go to this, um, visit this college? Um, I believe this is a Vanderbilt picture, by the way. Um, but that's, as I said, no longer the case for most colleges anymore. Although, again, they're starting to come back. This is more the case. And I'd say that one of the really benefits, and yes, there was a benefit of the pandemic, is the fact that it forced colleges to develop these robust ways to engage kids. And so all colleges now have ways where you can go online and learn a lot more about them, not just by reading their website, but because they have um, pre-recorded as well as live tours. They have information sessions, they have student panels, they have professor panels. Um, you can subscribe to their email list, which you could always do. You can follow them on social media. There's much more posting on, on social media. Um, and you can connect with the admissions rep who's going to be reading your file and, you know, ask a couple of questions. But I can't impress upon you enough how important it is to demonstrate your interest and not just to improve your chances for admission. Um, that's going to happen. 
for at many colleges, not necessarily all, but many of them. But it's really going to help your child figure out if this college is a good match. Can I really see myself here? And I've had parents come back from, you know, and say to me, you know, Susie wouldn't even get out of the car. She hated the look of the college. And as long as I find out what it was she hated, we can make sure that none of the other colleges on her list have that same characteristic. And yes, it's just as important to see things that you hate because it tells you the kinds of things that you will love. Um, so demonstrating your interest can really help you um, gain much more insight into what colleges are likely to be a better match for you. Um, I used to call this next one intellectual curiosity, but um, of late I've been switching to inter intellectual um, vitality. It just seems to jump off the page more. Um, and, and I'd say this is more important in a very highly selective university. Um, colleges are looking for kids, for instance, the kid who raised her rank because she took very hard dual enrollment courses that shows, in, you know, the vitality, but the one who took the, the, you know, sort of easier ones isn't showing that level of, of vitality. The student who's a debater, um, the student who takes additional courses beyond um, what's available in her own school's curriculum, the student who does summer programs that really like engage the brain, um, the student who does academic competitions, who does um, research, um, the student who has a recommendation where it says, uh, okay, number one, it could be Judy comes to me for extra help. She really, you know, is, is engaged and wants to learn as much as she can. That shows intellectual vitality, even though I'm coming for help. Or Judy comes to me to discuss, um, to gain more insight into a complex topic so that she can, can you know, have an even broader understanding of it. Okay. Those are the kinds of things that your much more selective colleges will be banking on, the students who are intellect, intellectually vital. Um, and yes, that can help if, even if it's not a highly competitive school, but it's this one is much more important at, at the, uh, well, we used to call them highly selective. A new toy, term was coined last year called highly rejective. So when you get to some elite universities that only admit four or five percent of their students and typically 90 percent of their students who are applying are you know probably straight A students but only five percent of them are going to get in. So um, demographic and personal characteristics. Um, Common App is specifically asking questions to try to figure out a little bit more about sort of your demographic. They're asking things like um, did your parents go to college? Um, where were your parents, you know, where was your family from? Um, do you have siblings who have gone to college? Um, what do your parents do for a living? They are evaluating the background from which you came. And so if one of your parents is a bus driver and the other one is a maintenance person, you actually have a better chance than if mom is a physician and dad is an attorney. Um, because the student who's coming from the wealthy background has had parents who probably were college educated and who have made sure that their child had every advantage possible. Whereas the student who's first gen, whose parents um, did not go to college or who may not necessarily have um, you know, professional um, employment, um, may be a student who's overcome obstacles and therefore their accomplishments are measured in, in a different way. And so colleges are very much looking at, you know, making sure that they are admitting, let's say, kids who, who are kind, who are generous, who are caring, who are collaborative and love that word collaborative. Yes, they want leaders, but they want collaborators and great listeners as well. And they really want to ensure a level of diversity that goes far beyond just, let's say, racial and socioeconomic diversity. And unfortunately, your ability to pay, I think, has become even more important. Many colleges lost an awful lot of money um, during COVID-19, um, especially when COVID-19 first hit. And last March, colleges were sending, you know, kids home and Many of them refunded their, you know, your money for like your room and your board. But, you know, colleges are businesses and, you know, they depend upon 
um, bringing in money from, you know, from, from food, from your shopping on campus, from um, your residence hall. And um, kids who are full pay may have a slight advantage at some schools, not at all schools. And there's certainly colleges that ignore your ability to pay in making their admission decisions. But there are plenty of colleges where your ability to pay might get you, you know, that first spot off the wait list. And then there's an extra step that most people don't even know exists. Um, and this was brought to life by Jeff um, Salingo in um, his recent book on college admission, where there's a final step called um, shaping the class, where before the very final decisions get mailed out, let's say sometime in March, they're going to be looking, the college is actually going to be looking over the class that they've admitted. And they may say, hey, you know what? We only have one student from North Dakota, but we have 83 kids from um, Virginia, and we really would like to have a few more kids from North Dakota. They may take the lowest kids, or whoever they feel the lowest, not necessarily GPA, but the last kids admitted from Virginia and throw them away and add in a couple of kids from North Dakota. Or they may recognize that, wait a minute, we have three tenured professors of Russian literature and not one student who we accepted wants to major in Russian literature. Let's find a few kids who want to major in Russian literature and maybe let's throw away our psycho a few psychology majors um, because we, we need to have that right balance in there. So sometimes college admission isn't necessarily about like admitting you because you 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 know, are the perfect student for them. But it's based on what that college is really looking for to shape their class. And this is a step that really goes unnoticed. And as a Jeff, Jeff Salingo brought it out last year um, in his book. And I think that, well, actually, before I go into this next little part, um, which is towards the end of my presentation anyway, um, Kathy, are there any other any questions that have come in? Yes, we just got one that came in. Um, someone would like to know they are interested in visited, visiting colleges this upcoming spring. How do they go about planning a visit? I would imagine it's much more involved than just showing up. Um, any advice is highly appreciated. Okay. Great. So, um, so first of all, you do not just show up. Um, that's like showing up at you know, an acquaintance's home and say, oh, what's for dinner? Um, you really want to call in advance, and I'd say spring break is definitely the most popular time to visit colleges. Many colleges have different spring breaks than your student may have, and in fact, if you want to find out which colleges will be essentially closed, in other words, well, they're not really closed, but where the kids aren't going to be there, um, if you were to Google, first of all, college spring break, you'll get a bunch of travel websites, and that's what you want. There are a number of travel agencies that make um, provide spring break or like trips for kids. Some of them are alternative spring break trips for community service. Others are, you know, fun vacation, come to, you know, Florida for the week. And it will say like, these are the colleges, say the week of March 17th, um, for whom we have, a, you know, a spring break trip and it will list all the colleges. So you could go on one of these websites and look up your spring break and then you'll know which colleges you might want to avoid visiting because there won't be students there. And it's always great to see a college when it's in full swing and students are there. You'll want to plan your, your visit geographically. Um, you can visit one or two colleges a day. Two colleges, I'd say, if they're within about an hour and a half of each other, you can fit in two campus visits a day. Otherwise, it's one. You need to call or register in advance. You can start by calling admissions and tell them that you, you know, like to plan a visit to their campus on such and such a date. And they will either take that information from you on the phone or direct you to someplace on their website to register for it. You generally need to register for um, what's called an information session and a campus tour. Now, some colleges may not know yet if they're really going to be doing them in spring break. I mean, we're definitely seeing the colleges come back to life in terms of um, allowing you to visit campus. Although um, one of my students just came back from visiting and it turned out that her mom was not allowed inside any of the buildings at um, um, the new school in New York City because although she had been vaccinated, she did not have proof of a recent COVID-19 negative test 
It turned out that her daughter's school requires that test every week and the daughter actually had proof. Um, so basically you always really want to be prepared. Um, but you'll spend, I would say bare minimum is two hours on a campus. Um, typically it's an information session for about an hour followed by a campus tour for about an hour. Some colleges will let you do more. Some colleges will let the student attend a class, um, meet with a professor, meet with another student. Um, so you definitely want to start calling. Um, you can call colleges now. They may not know yet if they're going to do anything over spring break. Um, if you're tuning in from New York or someplace in the New England area, your kids have off for a week in February. Um, that's another great time to visit colleges. Um, for those of you who have younger students and are planning ahead even for like next year, um, if you don't celebrate the Jewish holidays, um, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur are always in, in the beginning of the school year. And Palm Beach and Broward County schools are closed those days. They could be great days for visiting colleges. Some colleges also do campus tours and information sessions on Saturdays or Saturday mornings. And by the way, if, let's just say you were going to be in Boston for a weekend. Um, you were going up for a wedding and you decided to extend by a day and, you know, maybe visit BU and BC like, you know, that following Monday. But what you could do is you can call the university. Let's just say that you're a Christian. You can call and ask, um, for instance, if they have a chapter of Campus Crusade for Christ. Or if you're Jewish to ask, you know, do you have like a Hillel? Because you can be connected with a, um, a religious or like oh, the Asian Student Association, the Black Student Union, um, and find out if they have a student who they could introduce you to who might be willing to um, spend a couple of hours with you, um, you know, sharing information about their college, um, perhaps in turn for your taking them out to lunch. So I've definitely had students who have visited on a Saturday or a Sunday um, and found other students that way, or if you have a friend of a friend who goes you know, to school there, but I would definitely plan in advance by making phone calls. Um, and then there's a zillion th other things that you could do on a college campus, but I think that that probably answers the question. Um, anything else, Kathy? Nope, nothing else. Okay, thank you for the question. So I, I do want to, you know, sort of as, as we begin to close down, to bring to your attention that last year was absolutely an unprecedented year in college admission. It's true that college's admission gets harder every year, but it only inches up a tiny little bit each year that we, we definitely see, you know, like the percent admit might go from 37 to 35, or that the average ACT might go from a 20 eight to maybe a 29. But last year saw such an enormous spike. I mean, NYU had 100,000 applications. No private university in America has ever had anywhere near 100,000 applications. Or um, little Colgate University, you know, it's about 3,000 3, kids in upstate New York. Um, they had a 102% increase in applications, not just a 2 or 3% increase in applications. That And because applications skyrocketed so much last year, doesn't mean they accepted more kids. They, you know, they didn't create more beds or more classroom space. So what happened is last year became incredibly competitive, be, pretty much because of test optional, also because of the anxiety created, kids not knowing sort of what was coming next, Many kids apply to many more schools than they might have normally. Yes, some because of test optional. I don't have the score, but I might have the grades and think I could have a good chance of getting in so they applied, or I'm just not sure if I want to go away from home or not. Um, we do expect the same thing to happen again this year. And so just looking at what happened over 30 years, the hardest to, you know, get into, to get into college 30 years ago I had a 17% admit rate. We would welcome that today by from some of these elite universities. The lowest admit rate today is 3.4%. You know, that's basically saying that 97 out of 100 kids are just not getting in. So the applications absolutely skyrocketed um, this last year. And this is just for common application. And it went from 5.4 million to just over 6 million applications. I mean, that's an 11% increase that's unheard of and that increase was felt the most at our most selective universities um our most well-known universities our largest state universities um and some of them 
Well, I already told you about two of them, but honestly, many of them saw a 20 to 30 percent surge. Um, and in fact, this year, as I create college lists for some of my students, instead of just having things, you know, of let's say some things a reach, some things um, a, a like, a, you know, a target, some things a likely, I've actually created an extra category that I call lottery because even valedictorians are getting rejected at schools with a you know, single digit admission rate. So um, it's just you know, a range of schools. They're all relatively selective in here um, to show you how much the admissions changed from um, two years ago to just this past year. Um, the, the current admit rate is in yellow and you can see how it's pretty much down across the board. Okay. Something else that you should be acutely aware of is that it is really true. I hate the cliche, but the early bird does get the worm. Uh, I'm going to start with the Ivies because, by the way, the Ivies set the bar. And you may say, hey, wait a minute. Why are you talking about, like, you know, HYP, Harvard, Yale, Princeton? You know, my, my student is applying to, you know, George Washington, to Elon, to High Point, to Rollins, um, the College of the Ozarks, you know, they're applying to less selective schools, but understand that whatever the elites do, um, colleges that are sort of the next level down, the next level down, it's like that Me Too syndrome. If you're doing it, I'm doing it. So you can see that the admit rate for the students who applied early, because we have we have the data for only six of our eight Ivy League universities. Um, it, it was, you know, like what, three times as much? Um, it used to be twice as much. Now it's three times as much. It looks like an advantage um, at many of these schools for applying either early decision, which is the ED, or the SCEA is a restricted or single choice early action that has some nuances that in terms of where you are and are not allowed to apply early. But again, you're, you're, what you're seeing is that there was a tremendous advantage by applying early to the IVs. And let's go beyond that, and I can show you that, again, six IVs, um, where the admit rate was a bit close to 50% for all of these, and even the ones that look low, like Columbia, if just look to the left, you can see that 46% of the class was filled through early decision. So if you understand that there's a smaller percentage of kids who apply early, and they're filling half the class, it's significantly more competitive when you apply in regular season. And by the way, you can only apply to one college early decision, although there are some nuances with early decision one and early decision two, where you can apply to one each if you don't get in early decision one. But I also wanted to show you that it went beyond just the IVs. Um, I've included some other, you know, very selective schools in here to show you that they are also filling roughly, you know, half of their class early. So finally, there are a few other admission um, webinars that I've recently done that um, hopefully you'll want to watch and, you know, get some more information that can, you know, help you plan for college effectively. And we certainly hope that you'll call us to see if, if we can help you, um, you know, individually or even in a group um, to get admit, admitted to the college of your dreams. In fact, right now, we actually do have a college admissions boot camp going. Um, it's, it has three more sessions to go. We'd find way, and we've recorded all the other two sessions. It, it is being done completely virtually. I'm leading it, but you can get an awful lot of your college, you know, application work done. And we do this every year. Um, this was our 17th summer of doing a college admissions boot camp. Second summer that we've done it virtually. Um, if you're interested in it, you can certainly, you know, register for it online. We can, um, get you to have you make up the classes that you've missed. And finally, we do have a, a special promotion going on right now that if you want someone to review your personal statement, um, do a single review of it, give you feedback verbally and in writing. Um, we're doing that for, for just $99. Um, basically just, you know, to do whatever we can to um, help you get into the college of your dreams. I'll stop um, now. I'm at the end to see whether anyone has any questions that I could answer for them. Let's see. I don't see any others in the chat right now. Okay. So if you do have questions, honestly, you can feel to, um, to feel free to email me at Judy, J-U-D-I, at 
scoreatthetop.com. It's one of the emails that will um, easily get to me. Um, I want to thank you for um, coming tonight. Um, I hope I've been insightful and that you've gained you know, some tidbits of, of information. Please stay healthy, take care of yourselves, and lots of luck with your college admissions. Good night, everyone. And actually, my little granddaughter is also saying good night. <laughs> Thanks. Good night.